um, serum LDL cholesterol is an important risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and diabetes mellitus. Two by a show of hands. Questions. questions. You, they already gave you the answers. Oh, We're going to have them hold the questions oh, till the end. Please. Yeah, I'm going to try to leave yeah. time okay. for debate, question and debate, yeah. and debate. Thank you for coming on this cold evening. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ellen. Uh, so let's get down right to it. And basically, they're proposing that, yes, uh, diabetes is a equivalent, is that it's, it's equivalent to a patient who's already had a heart attack, uh, even if they've never had any prior evidence of atherosclerotic heart disease, they have a risk of having a heart attack as high as somebody who's already had a heart attack. And because of that, um, and because LDL cholesterol is an important risk factor for everybody, including patients with diabetes, we should be treating these patients as if they've already had a heart attack basically putting them on statins because it's been shown in randomized controlled trials, prospective studies, to uh, be extremely effective in reducing risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease for primary prevention. So that's their argument. So we're going to go through each of these points one by one. First of all, is diabetes mellitus a risk factor equivalent to having already had a heart attack? And the proponents always start, I mean, all the lectures I've been to on this issue have always started the lecture with this slide by Hafner, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1998. And it's called the East-West Study, and it was on type 2 diabetes, and they looked at seven-year incidence of fatal and non-fatal MI. And you can see they had over 1,000 people in each group. And if you compare the patients without diabetes who had had an MI, uh, they had a 19% risk of having a second MI in that seven-year span to patients with diabetes who had never had an MI, and they had a 20% risk, almost identical. So that's the argument. This is basically the argument. Now, the devil's in the details, so let's take a look at the study itself. This is Dr. Hafner, who was the lead author, but notice that all these other names are from Finland. So this is actually a study from Finland that started in 1982. This is when they started recruiting patients in 1982 and 1984. So one problem is that is a study from Finland done in the 1980s relevant to people in Western Massachusetts in the 2000s. Second issue is that uh, while this, this, these ends look pretty good, they don't tell you the ends for these two bars or these two bars. And if you look at the ends, actually this group only had 69 people. That's a very low sample size. That's a problem in interpreting these data. I personally don't think that supports their conclusion that these data provide a rationale for treating cardiovascular risk factors in diabetic patients as aggressively as people who've already had an MI. By the way, Stephen Hafner, he, you might have read about him in the New York Times in 2008, 10 years later. He was a reviewer for the New England Journal of Medicine, and he came across, he was asked to review a paper on the India, which was a, um, a negative study, and he sent the paper before it was published to the uh, drug manufacturer, yeah, and uh, Nature actually uh, interviewed him at the time as saying, why well, he sent it is a mystery, I don't really understand it. <laughs> but more importantly for us is that he had started receiving consulting and speaking to these from Glaxo in 1999, uh, around the time that this study was published. Now, the great thing about the New England Journal of Medicine is that they have a terrific correspondence section. I often learn a lot more from the correspondence than the original study. Because, you know, they're critical. And sure enough, six months later or so, comes this letter to the editor by the Simonses, who were doing the exact same study in Australia. And they recruited patients in the late 80s, older people. And what were their findings? Well, kind of the exact opposite. Here are the non-diabetic subjects. Yes, 478 non-diabetic subjects who had had an MI. Their rate of having a second MI was 53%, 53 per 100 compared to the diabetics who'd never had an MI, and they had a 31.5 risk per 100 subjects. Yes, it's a higher risk than the non-diabetic patients, but it's not as high a risk as the patients who had already had a previous myocardial infarction. Okay, let's fast forward to this meta-analysis that was done, published in 2008. 
is diabetes a coronary risk factor equivalent? They did a systematic review and a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is a thorough summary of many studies or several studies, as many studies as they can find on the same topic. And they usually present the data in these uh, uh, forest plots. So this is a forest plot. And um, so the strength of the study, the, the number of subjects is illustrated in these forest plots by the bigness of the square. So small studies have small squares, big studies have big squares. They sum up all the data and they come up with this. And you can see, yes, the Hafner study is, well, it's weak because it crosses, it crosses one. The odds ratio crosses one because of the small sample size. There's another you know, neutral study, but all the other studies are on this side of the line favoring diabetes as not being a coronary heart disease risk factor equivalent. So they concluded that this meta-analysis did not support this hypothesis and that patients should not be treated with a blanket approach. Later study, just published a few months ago in vascular pharmacology by these epidemiologists, did it a little differently. They asked the same question, but instead of doing a meta-analysis with a blobogram or a forest plot, they just looked at all the data and they came up with studies that support the concept, studies that refute the concept, and studies that really don't give an answer. And they're about evenly divided. About a third of the studies, eight or nine studies, yes, said yes. About eight or nine studies said no. Seven or eight studies couldn't tell. So they took a closer look at the studies that were positive favoring diabetes as a coronary heart disease risk factor equivalent, and they, they saw that some of these studies were very underpowered. They noticed the Hafner study was underpowered, and these studies were also underpowered. And so it doesn't really necessarily mean that these studies were really positive studies given the uh, numbers of people in the studies. By the way, up until now, we've been talking about type 2 diabetes. And for the rest of the talk, we'll mostly be talking about type 2 diabetes. But I just want to introduce this on type 1 diabetes, since the talk is about diabetes. And this was a study that was just published in Diabetes Care. And they looked at uh, people with type 1 diabetes primary, never had any evidence of uh, clinical coronary artery disease or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and they looked at their coronary artery calcification score, and this is just an example where you can actually, from an electron beam CT, actually to see the calcium in the coronary arteries. You can total it up, and you can get a score. It's called an Agustin score. When they looked at the Agustin scores on their patients, these patients were 20 to 50 years old. They had diabetes for around 20 years. Half of them were smokers. 82% had zero Agustin score. So I don't even think type 1 diabetes is necessarily a risk factor equivalent for having uh, an MI. So they concluded, Salian Drexel, that no, uh, it's not a risk factor equivalent because not all patients with diabetes are equal. Let's take a look at see what UpToDate has to say on this topic. This is a chapter by Dr. Nesto, current chapter. Diabetes as a CHD equivalent. Well, the NCEP says it is. The guidelines from Europe consider it is, and based in part upon reference for the Hafner study. All right. And then he says similar findings have been noted in other studies. See myocardial infarction below. All right. Let's take a look at myocardial infarction below. Importance of diabetes is a risk factor for MI. The Hafner study. All right. Similar findings have been noted in other studies. 24-25. Okay. Let's take a look at those. 24, cardiovascular events in diabetic and non-diabetic adults with or without a history of MI. Conclusions, diabetic patients without MI had lower risk of coronary heart disease events and mortality from CVD compared with non-diabetic patients with MI. 25, notice these names. All the same names as in the finished study, except the first author has changed. This is just an update of the same subject, same 69 people. Okay, all right. Also see treatment of lipids, including hypercholesterolemia and secondary prevention, section on identification of patients at risk. Okay, let's take a look at that. Well, he didn't write that chapter. Dr. Rosenson wrote that chapter. It's the updated chapter. He says, although some guidelines have considered all patients with diabetes to have a risk of CV events similar to patients with known CVD, it's actually averages events across patients with widely differing risks of coronary heart disease. Given this, it's preferable to calculate patient-specific risk rather than simply consider all patients with diabetes requiring treatment. OK, so is LDL cholesterol a risk? How important is this as a risk factor for people with diabetes? The concept of risk factors actually starts 
with the Framingham study, which was initiated at the behest of Congress after Franklin Delano Roosevelt died of a stroke, and they wanted to get to the bottom of increasing prevalence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the United States, and they threw a lot of money at Congress. Congress threw a lot of money into it, and they gave a lot of money to these Harvard guys, and Framingham was close to Harvard, and here we have the Framingham Heart Study. And they saw if your serum cholesterol was above 260 in Framingham, your rate of atherosclerotic heart disease in these male patients over a four-year follow-up was 122 per 1,000. If it was under 260 or uh, yeah, under 260, it was significantly less. So this is the origin for uh, measuring cholesterol as a risk factor. Calling it a risk factor came later. They, these are factors of risk. This was the publication in the Annals from the Framingham study, a, a six-year follow-up now, looking at cholesterol versus blood pressure. No matter what your blood pressure is, if your cholesterol is high, you have a higher incidence, a higher six-year incidence of coronary heart disease. This is not diabetes. There's a lot of biological plausibility to the fact that LDL cholesterol does participate in the atherosclerotic process from these patients with severe atherosclerosis in patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. This is a 20-year-old asymptomatic person who walks in with these large nodular lesions, and these are huge tendon xanthomas. If you cut these open, you can see the cholesterol clefts. This is all cholesterol, all these cholesterol clefts. There's a lot of biological plausibility. This is his, this 20-year-old already has fairly severe coronary artery disease. He has aortic calcification. You can see it on the angiogram, the stenoses. It's amazing what these cardiologists can do these days, open up these stenoses. Uh, laboratory tests show that he has, an L, he has a total cholesterol up of 785 and LDL of 710, and he's homozygous for mutation on the LDL receptor gene. So this is the LDL receptor, which is a transmembrane receptor that binds to the apoprotein B molecule, the protein molecule on this LDL particle. Um, and defects in this receptor or defects in this particle, and now there are hundreds of them that have been described, uh, cause familial hypercholesterolemia. It's an autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia, so if you have one allele, you are heterozygote. The heterozygotes are less severely affected than the homozygotes but they're still affected, and this is their total cholesterol levels, and while they don't get as premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, eventually after the age of 30 or 40, they do get cardiovascular disease at fairly high rates, and uh, not everybody gets it, but up around 90% probably by the end of their lives, but you know, you have to die of something at age 90. What's going on here is that the LDL receptor transported through the Golgi apparatus to the cell surface. These are the receptors. They get, they uh, congregate in these clathrin-coated pits. They attract the lipoproteins that have the appropriate apoprotein molecules that can recognize the receptor. They're, they undergo endocytosis, and then the receptor recycles back to the surface. Now, it turns out that autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia is not only associated with mutations of the LDLR and the ApoB, turns out now we know it's also associated with mutations in this gene, this PCSK9 gene, can also cause autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia. This was reported first about 10 years ago. What's going on here is that this protein, PCSK9, which encodes NARC1, or it's really now known just as the PCSK9 protein, uh, is a protein that's also transported to the surface along with the LDL receptor, and it gloms onto the LDL receptor, and then it doesn't allow the receptor to be recycled back to the surface, it destroys the receptor. And now we know that patients who have sequence variations in this gene can actually end up having low LDL cholesterol, and that protects them against getting coronary heart disease. Here's blacks, uh, normals, people with these two genetic defects, fairly low LDL cholesterol, this is a genetic defect that you can find in whites, also lowish. And when you look at the incidence of coronary heart disease in these patients, uh, uh, it was much lower than the patients who did not have any mutations, particularly in blacks, less of a protective effect in, in whites from this uh, genetic abnormality. Um, by the way, there are drugs coming down the road. There is a monoclonal antibody in phase, four, in phase three trials against PCSK9 as a, a way of uh, increasing the life of the LDL receptor and thereby lowering the LDL cholesterol. Uh, 
level, serum LDL cholesterol level. So is serum LDL cholesterol an important risk factor for atherosclerosis and diabetes? We know it's important in familial hypercholesterolemia. Is it important? Maybe it's important in Framingham. Is it important in patients with diabetes? And this stems from this paper by Stern, where he proposes the common soil hypothesis. Because unlike the microvascular complications that come from the hyperglycemia, you see the atherosclerosis really before the hyperglycemia. And so he's proposing that atherosclerosis in diabetes has a common genetic and environmental antecedent. They spring from a common soil. I'm glad you put in environmental, because environmental is very important. For example, I just want to show these data. Look at this study from patients with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Some of these patients stayed in China, and some of these patients with the same or similar mutation in the LDL receptor moved to Canada. Small numbers, granted small numbers, but these data are very hard to come by. Relatively young age, but you can see the Canadian folks already had a 25% uh, rate of coronary artery disease versus the people who stayed in China where there was zero. So environment ha can even modify the risk of atherosclerosis in, in patients with, uh, who are heterozygous for familial hypercholesterolemia, and you can see their cholesterol levels are different as well. What about the cholesterol levels in patients with diabetes? So uh, the proponents often show this slide in their lectures on the distribution of LDL cholesterol and coronary heart disease among diabetes without diabetes. Well, if you look at LDL cholesterol, they're identical. What's really different is VLDL and non-HDL and triglycerides. That's what's really different. And that's the so-called diabetic dyslipidemia. And, and we're talking about non-HDL cholesterol. That includes all these particles that have a reputation for being atherogenic. It's LDL. And even LDL has difference in particle sizes. And there's evidence that smaller particle sizes may be more atherogenic than larger particle sizes. These particles may be more atherogenic than LDL, and that's VLDL. So the, this is what we're talking about, this, this mix, small LDL, IDL, and VLDL elevation. That's what you typically see in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now, when these uh, same investigators plotted it out, and this, again, is a slide that's commonly shown by the proponents, uh, you can see that it's a little complicated, but let's just look at the patients without diabetes. Those with a non-HDL less than 130, if their LDL was greater than 100, it raised their risk. Those with a non-HDL greater than 130, if their LDL was high, uh, greater than 100, it raised their risk. Here are the diabetic patients. If their non-HDL was less than 130 and their LDL was greater than 100, it didn't seem to matter. If their non-HDL, meaning IDL, VLDL, LDL, was greater than 130 and their LDL was greater than 100, it didn't really matter. So it's probably the dyslipidemia that's a better risk factor than LDL cholesterol. Here you go, less than 100 without diabetes. They set it at 1.0. This is relative risk. Without diabetes, less than 100, that's the 1.0. Compared to people with diabetes, it's elevated. Even when it's less than 100, it's even more elevated than patients with 100 to 130. Now, these data have been, we've sort of been, this talk has sort of been overtaken by events because the AHA has now come out and said LDL is not a risk factor, the, the actual level of serum LDL. They're abandoning their LDL targets if you've been reading the newspaper. The ACE has already weighed in, the American Association of Clinical Gynecologists, the lipidologists have weighed in, and the American Diabetes Association just published their new guidelines uh, last week, and they are not abandoning these targets, but I believe that the cardiologists actually have it right this time, as opposed to the endocrinologist. Now, um, so they're saying, and they looked at selected subgroups, including patients with diabetes, and they found no decent evidence to support the continued use of specific LDL cholesterol treatment targets. And neither could I. On the other hand, they do say, as does the ADA, that, okay, if it's 70 to 189, we should be initiating statin therapy. So that brings up the third point. Are these drugs extremely effective? And extremely, I've taken literally from talks I've attended. That's not my language. That's language from people who speak on this topic. They generally start this part of their talk by quoting this study from the cholesterol treatment trialists. Sometimes they're called the Oxford group because they're from Oxford, England. 
And this was their meta-analysis that was published in 2008 in The Lancet on 14 randomized trials, findings, 21% proportional reduction in major vascular events per millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol in people with diabetes with a 0.79 relative risk, and it does not, the confidence interval is 0.72 to 0.86, p-value is very strong, interpretation, we should consider statin therapy for everybody with diabetes. Well, let's take a look at the uh, data. Uh, here's the 18,000 some odd people. Well, it truly wasn't, it actually wasn't a uh, primary prevention meta-analysis because they had people with vascular disease. Some had coronary artery disease and other vascular disease. So we're talking about primary prevention right now and uh, that's what I'm gonna concentrate on. I'm gonna concentrate on this group. But look, this group had an even lower relative risk, surprising, they even had a lower relative risk than the people who were treated with statins who had vascular disease actually even worked better in the people who were using it for primary prevention, which is a little surprising. And the rate went down from 11.8% in the control group to 9.2% in the uh, treatment group. Um, there was a later meta-analysis that really was truly, mostly, the pr only the primary prevention trials, and that was published two years ago now. And they, their number totaled 12,711, 12,000 people. And uh, that was the, similar to the number in the primary, prevent, in the primary prevention cohort in the CTT data. And they came basically to the same conclusion. Their uh, risk of major adverse cardiovascular and cerebral vascular events, the um, odds ratio was 0.79, very similar to a relative risk of 0.79 with a confidence interval that did not cross one and a p-value of 0.01. So very similar finding to the CTT. Well, actually, I think Kelly brought this article to my attention from American Family Physicians, How to Evaluate and Understand Articles About Treatment. It's a very interesting article. I, 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 it's about a three-page article. It'll take about 20 minutes to read. It's worth, worth reading. And he points out, Mr. Shaughnessy here points out that it's important to know whether a treatment is effective. It's more important, however, to know how effective it is. And what he's really talking about is the difference between efficacy which is the ability to produce a desired result versus effectiveness, which is the degree to which the result is that, is, is it that good? How effective is it? So the relative risk reduction provides information on the magnitude of the difference, but not necessarily the clinical importance. Relative risk differences can be large and statistically significant, even if the clinical difference is trivial. And a better number to use would be the number needed to treat to really understand these data. And there are ways of getting this number. Now, you can't get this number from some of these papers. They don't publish it. But you can do it for yourself. You can just Google, just Google or put in any search engine number needed to treat. And this might be the first or second uh, um, site that comes up. You click on it, and you can see how effective is clinical treatment because many people find it hard to think about small fractions, like our patients, Maybe we're better off giving these data and number needed to treat. It's better understood. So we have to enter these numbers. And please, don't enter fractions, percentages, or you know, some other value. So let's look at the CTT. These are the diabetics without vascular disease. These are the treatments. These are the controls. Just extract these data. Click on Compute. We got the 11.8% down to 9.2%. Difference, the absolute difference is 2.6%. The number needed to treat to do good is 39. Confidence interval is 27 to 66. So you have to treat as many as 66 people to benefit one person. Very similar to this uh, primary care, primary prevention meta-analysis by these folks. Same number needed to treat 40, similar confidence interval. Now, is it even true that the number needed to treat is 40? So let's take a look, you know, doubles in the details. So here are the studies that these folks looked at. And we're gonna discount this one because the numbers are too small. So here's another forest plot. And you can see the numbers here are so small, you can barely see the box. So we're gonna just deal with these studies. And there's really only three positive studies. The other studies are neutral. They cross the confidence line. And this study, PROSPER, is actually over here. It crosses, but the odds ratio on the PROSPER study was 
So let's concentrate on the positive studies. The ASCOT LLA in, that was published in 2003 and the CARDS and HPS studies because those are the two largest studies and they were positive. Now actually, this is the ASCOT LLA from 2003 and you can see diabetes, hey, it's not actually positive, it's actually negative, it crosses the line. Uh, and actually they even comment on this, that given the potential benefit of lipid lowering in patients with diabetes, it was at first sight surprising that the relative reduction was less of a primary endpoint among patients with diabetes than among those without. However, you know, the number of events was pretty low, so maybe not reality. So actually, what they were referring to in that meta-analysis was this study that was published in 2005, sort of a post hoc analysis of the ASCOT LLA, looking at diabetes, but adding in procedures. So you can see fatal and non-fatal stroke, non-fatal and fatal heart attack, the numbers do cross one, they're not statistically significant, but if you add in procedures, then you get a statistically significant result. Well, that's a post hoc analysis, you know, that introduces bias, that's a problem. That, I think that makes the data somewhat weaker in terms of whether this drug really works to prevent, it might, you know, prevent us from undergoing cardiac procedures, but does it really prevent us from having heart attacks and strokes? What about the CARDS trial? The CARDS trial was mostly white men. Very high drop-in, drop-out rate at four years of 37 percent. I'm told by people who do this for a living that a drop-in, drop-out rate uh, should be less than 20 percent to really make heads or tails of the study. And it really also wasn't strictly primary prevention. Some of these patients had non-severe peripheral vascular disease. In addition, Gosmanov, in his point counterpoint on this issue, published in the Clinical Lipidology Journal in 2010, points out that the LDL cholesterol goals in patients with diabetes, he doesn't feel are adequately based on the evidence. And what he points out is that the HPS and CARDS trial, these patients had much higher smoking rates than the OSCOT and the ASPEN trial. And so there was a potential bias that if more people stopped smoking, it wasn't the Lipitor, it was the stopping the smoking. Well, you go into the data, it's not actually, he's a little overstating the case because the 68 and 66, those were the number of smokers present in past, okay? So the present smokers compared to the present smokers in the negative or marginally positive studies are actually the same. But we don't know from these data whether these people had a higher, as high a rate of past smoking. If they didn't, it still introduces this bias, but we can't know that. And there's a lot of plausibility for this because take a look at this. You know, the per capita consumption of cigarettes peaked at around 1965, right around the Surgeon General report, and CHD deaths started to fall at that point, as did smoking. That kind of superimposed these curves. So you can see the curve goes down. Here's where statins were introduced, by the way. No dramatic drop here. Sort of parallels the curve. So the drop in smoking parallels the drop in um, CHT deaths. And if you read the Times yesterday, you can also see in the Times that it also parallels the drop in stroke. The other problem you have to deal with in meta-analyses is publication bias. Yeah. So um, could there be publication bias? I mean, take a look at this forest plot. You can imagine that there's a couple of studies on this side, this diamond, comes here, and that's a negative meta-analysis. And that's a you know, take a look at this. Now, this is the blob of ground. This is the forest plot we had from is diabetes a coronary heart disease risk factor. That's, a, that's strong. You know, a couple of studies here aren't going to make a difference, but a couple of studies on this side, it could matter. And there's evidence for this. There's evidence for this. All these trials are sponsored by pharmaceutical. They're all sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. And here we have non-publicated, this was just published, the BMJ, non-publication of large randomized clinical trials, 585 registered trials. That doesn't count the non-registered trials. 29% unpublished and 78% of those, you can find the results in the, in the, in where they're supposed to be deposited and when they go unpublished. And then you've got to deal with the issue of mortality. So here's the mortality data on the primary prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with statin use in patients with diabetes. Only three studies reported mortality. And it didn't reach statistical significance. It crossed the confidence interval across one. So their conclusion was that for primary prevention in patients with diabetes without established cardiovascular disease, 
Statin therapy could reduce cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events, but not off-course mortality. Well, that brings up the issue of safety. I mean, how safe is it to lower serum LDL cholesterol by inhibiting the cellular biosynthesis of the cholesterol? Well, to know that, unfortunately, you're going to have to learn, relearn a little biochemistry and cell physiology. This may get a little boring, but you have to know the language. You've got to know the lingo to understand these data on the safety of statins. So let's remind ourselves that cholesterol is made from this two-carbon molecule acetate. It's a pretty ubiquitous molecule. It's the building block of many, many other molecules besides cholesterol. The first thing that happens is stage one, three of these acetates condense to form a valinate. The valinate then undergoes a conversion where it loses a carbon and it's the spot, it becomes a five isoprene unit which is activated by becoming uh, phosphorylated. This is the general scheme. So you have acetate to isoprene. Isoprene then polymerizes, it can polymerize into all different combinations. The 30 carbon isoprenoid is squalene, and it's a linear, still, still a linear structure. Squalene then undergoes these conversions using uh, cyclase enzymes, and these, this linear molecule gets cyclized into a sterol. So now you have acetate to isoprene. Isoprene, five of those, or six of those, become squalene. Squalene gets cyclized into linosterol. And then linosterol undergoes a bunch of conversions to form the final product, cholesterol. And cholesterol, we know, is important. This is my only endocrinology in the slide. It turns into steroid hormones. Vitamin D is a steroid hormone because it's made in skin, cholesterol, cortisol, aldosterone, gonadal hormones, also made into bile salts, and it's an integral part of cell membranes. So here's your plasma membrane. Cholesterol maintains the integrity of the cell membrane. Without it, it they'd be mush. They wouldn't be firm enough. On the other side of the coin, they actually help maintain the fluidity by separating the, the uh, phospholipids. So you can see this, this is your lipid bilayer in the cell membrane. It's made up of phospholipids, and the cholesterol gets interspersed in here. Here's an integral protein, like our LDL receptor, for example, protein. And so you need a certain amount of cholesterol to maintain the fluidity of your cell membrane. Also, there are these lipid rafts in your cell membrane that have extra cholesterol in them, and these rafts are places where these proteins tend to be secured in the membrane. And these places have three to five fold. And if you don't think that inhibiting cholesterol metabolism doesn't actually alter membrane cholesterol content, take a look at this paper from the Journal of Hypertension in 1994. They looked at platelets in red cells, and sure enough, the red cell in the platelet, I didn't show the platelet data, but the red cell membrane cholesterol goes down, versus the placebo, and it does have biological effect because it affects sodium efflux. All right, now the cell wants to prevent overaccumulation of free cholesterol because free cholesterol is very toxic to the cell. So it has these ways of preventing this overaccumulation. It can decrease the uptake by the LDL receptor and it can increase reverse transport using HDL. It can esterify the cholesterol, and it can decrease synthesis. And the main way that most cells prevent overaccumulation of cholesterol is by decreasing synthesis by feedback inhibition of the HMG CoA reductase enzyme. So you're making here's your pathway, okay? Acetate, which can be derived from glucose, HMG CoA reductase turns it into mevalinate. Mevalinate uh, loses a carbon, turns into isoprene. And the isoprenes uh, isomerize, they form all these molecules, and eventually squalene turns into cholesterol. Cholesterol then feeds back on the rate limiting steps, synthase and reductase and kinase, to block further production of cholesterol. And then we have these specialized cells, as we talked about, in the, in the liver and the endocrine organs that produce steroid hormones that can also be inhibited. Their expression can be inhibited also by cholesterol, so they downregulate 
LDL receptors and that way prevent overaccumulation of cholesterol in intracellularly. Now, opposite that is if you inhibit the cholesterol synthesis, you get a decline in intracellular cholesterol, you get an uptick in LDL receptor activity, you also get an uptick in HMG Hori reductase, by the way. And when you increase LDL receptor, it overcomes all of this in the liver, overcomes the increase in synthesis by an increase in HMG-CoA reductase, and you get a decline in ApoB and ApoE-containing uh, lipoproteins that circulate. That's how it works. Now, the first drug to stop cellular synthesis of cholesterol did not work here where the statins work. It worked down here, way down here, right? way down here, right at this step, the very last step. So you take squalene, goes through all these conversions, eventually to cholesterol, and we block it with a drug called triparanol. That's the very first drug. I'm gonna pick the story up. I saw this, uh, this is a historian for the uh, FDA who um, published this paper on Adams' success story involving the FDA academia and industry, and she points out that in 1962, um, it was a drug that was produced by a company called Merrill. I, presumably Merrill turned into Merrill Dow, but the Merrill company started a big push in the 50s to find drugs that lowered cholesterol synthesis and would lower serum cholesterol. And by 59, they, by 58 or 59, they had patented triparanol, and they had the drug immediately approved within a year maybe less, marketed it, it was given to hundreds of thousands of patients, and then it was withdrawn from the market soon thereafter, just a couple years later, because the FDA had discovered that they had falsified some lab data with reference to cataracts. Well, also in the public record is the fact that the company had hired Beulah Jordan, was their laboratory technician. She was studying it in eight monkeys and they had asked her to falsify the safety data, and one of the monkeys who was really getting sick disappeared. So she, she didn't want to falsify the data. She quits her job, she tells her husband. Her husband happens to carpool with an FDA investigator. <laughs> he finds out about it. They raid, they literally raid the company, and within two days, MER-29, which is what they marketed it as, was removed from the market after they discovered preclinical findings before the drug was marketed of cataracts in rats and dogs, muscle wasting and musking, and other falsified, unreported data ended up going to a federal grand jury. They pleaded no, no lo contendere, and they ended up costing them $200 million in 1963 or four. That's a lot of money, I think, back then, yeah. Yeah. Well, what the heck is this slide doing in this talk? Did I make a mistake? Okay, well, right around the time this is happening, a lot of turkeys are dying in England and nobody knows quite why. They were getting coma and dropping dead, all these hundreds of thousands of turkeys, and nobody knew what it was. And they traced it to the meal that had been imported from Brazil, and they traced it to a toxic substance that was in this ground meal, and they called it aflatoxin. And it also, it's, a, it's, from, it's from a mold. So this is, aflatoxin is a mycotoxin, meaning it's a toxic substance that's derived from fungus, Mold is a unicellular type of fungus. And nobody really knows why molds produce mycotoxins. They're not really necessary for the growth or development of the, of the mold. Uh, but they were found to be immunosuppressive and carcinogenic. In fact, right around the same time these turkeys were dying in England, we were losing all our rainbow trout in our trout farms in the United States. And it was also traced to the contamination of commercial trout feed by aflatoxin. And these findings led to worldwide efforts to find their mechanism of action. And that's why we're talking about aflatoxins, because Dr. Cipristine found out, and he lectured at the 1969 meeting of the American Clinical and Climatological Association. And he gave this wonderful lecture, and he presented these data on the effects of aflatoxin on cholesterol feedback control in rainbow trout. So you know, if you feed a rainbow trout, uh, a normal diet, they'll make cholesterol. If you feed them a high cholesterol diet, they'll stop making cholesterol in the cell because feedback inhibition. If you inject them with aflatoxin, it screws it up and their cholesterol levels start to climb. The intracellular cholesterol concentration starts to climb. And he published this in their transaction in this wonderful paper, 
you have time, I'd really, it's really wonderful reading on cholesterol and cancer, and he credits Huxley's, one of Huxley's uh, uh, characters in Many a Summer, uh, about making the connection between cancer as sterile poisoning. Well, I suspect that Dr. Endo read that paper because the following year he starts working for Sankyo and starts testing strains of molds for mycotoxins that would stop lipid synthesis as a weapon in the fight against other microbes. He was looking for an antimicrobial agent. So mycotoxins, we said, are not necessary for growth or development, but maybe the fungus uses them as a antibacterial agent. So he hoped that certain of these fungi would produce such compounds to fight off other microbes that require sterols or isoprenoids for growth. Now remember, isoprenoids come from acetate to isoprene, and they're polymerized, and there's thousands of these molecules. All of these molecules, not cholesterol, but squalene, dolico, all these molecules are isoprenoids. So the basis for the, all these isoprenoids is this isopentanyl pyrophosphoric acid, and these molecules have function. This one participates in DNA replication. This one is cell differentiation, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe the one you know the most is ubiquitone. That's probably the most well-known one. It's also known as coenzyme Q10. So coenzyme Q10 is an isoprenoid. It's got a, the Q refers to the quinone, and the 10 refers to 10 isoprene, so it's a 50 carbon molecule. This is, this is, I couldn't fit it on the slide, so this would be called Q3, because it's got three of them. If it had 10 of them, it would be Q10. So that's what coenzyme Q10 is. It's a uh, isoprenoid. Now, he did isolate a compound called citronin that did block HMG reductase and stopped all of this subsequent metabolism. But he abandoned it because it was too toxic. And that doesn't surprise Professor Ford. I found this lecture on the internet. He's a professor up at University of Maine, a biochem professor. Striking about these statins is they act at such an early stage in the biosynthesis at exclamation point. So he's not surprised that these guys have numerous side effects, but he's not a doctor, he's a professor. Endo extracts another mycotoxin, calls it ML236B, less toxic, and it lowers blood cholesterol. This is it, mevastatin, I suppose, because it stops mevalinate production, also called compactin. Here's the HMG array reductase with HMG, and here it is with the statin, same, same deal, seem to be bound in pretty much the same place. So this is classical competitive inhibition, and it becomes the first HMG coa reductase inhibitor that, we're given, that was given to humans. Endo gave it to a few patients with, or he had a doctor give it, he's not a physician, he had a friend, doctor in Japan, give it to a few patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. It didn't work in the homozygotes, as you wouldn't expect it to, because you can't upregulate LDL receptors, because they don't have any LDL receptors, but it did work in the heterozygote patients. They provided these data to Merck, as well as some samples over a handshake. It was a one-page agreement, and Merck, uh, shortly thereafter, isolated lovastatin. The only difference between mevastatin and lovastatin is this group. Instead of a hydrogen, it's got a methyl group. Okay, now the story picks up with uh, the FDA historian. Merck terminates the trials when rumors surface that compactin might be causing some cancers in dogs. Rory Vagalos, the Merck CEO at the time, subsequently published this book, uh, made the decision to discontinue clinical trials. Actually, there may be some evidence out there in the public record that half the dogs actually developed cancer from compactin. And the other reason why Dr. Vagalos may have stopped it because he may have been aware of these subsequent data by Dr. Cyperstein on the essential role of mevalinate synthesis in DNA replication. So here's the cell cycle. Synthesis, gap one, mitosis, gap two, synthesis again, thymidine uptake in normal cells, very little thymidine uptake in, drug, in cells treated with compactin in these two synthesis stages. But when you treat the compacted treatment along with mevalinate, you restore the ability of, the, uh, of DNA synthesis. Sounds dangerous. 
So following Merck's decision to terminate these clinical trials, the FDA became actively involved in maintaining interest in the development of statins. I don't know why. There's no public record as to why that is. Uh, it's a curious thing. So in 82, Merck gave lovastatin to a couple of docs, including Illingsworth, who had patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, and nothing worked you know, in familial hypercholesterolemia. But this stuff did. So here's his initial publication that he presented in 83 and published it in 84 in the annals. We can see uh, these are all the patients. I think he had 12 or 13 patients, and it worked in all of them, almost like a charm. And, you know, the more you gave, the greater reduction you had, and it didn't really lower HDL, and it did the good, it did actually had some triglyceride-lowering property. Now, right around that time, besides Illingsworth's publication, the LRCCPPT came out, which showed that diet and cholestyramine, the bile, the bile resin, demonstrated that lowering cholesterol for 70 years on the average resulted in 19% relative reduction in endpoint of heart disease, death, or heart attack. You know, felt to be, uh, so it was a positive study. So lowering cholesterol with cholestyramine and diet actually did reduce the risk of heart attack and death. At the same time, Brown and Goldstein were about to win the Nobel Prize for elucidating the pathophysiology of familial hypercholesterolemia. So these things, and Illingsworth's work, spurred new commercial interest in, in statins. And so they submitted an IND a application and approved nine months after its submission, according to this FDA historian, record time. Now, the decision by the Division of Metabolic and Endocrine Drug Products to approve agents for marketing based on the surrogate of lowering LDL cholesterol is a key component in shortening the review time for lovastatin. So it has to do with surrogate endpoints. We haven't said anything about these drugs lowering risk of heart attack yet at this stage of the game. So surrogates are very seductive. I commend this article to you. They have the power to confer a false sense of understanding and control, and then the short-term effects of treatment are visible, whereas the true outcomes may be years into the future, and it, it confuses the disease and its surrogate, the LDL, with the heart attack. And it paves the way for uncritical acceptance of surrogate evidence from clinical trials. Full disclosure, the authors had conflicts of interest. They're all members of healthy skepticism. <laughs> the aim of healthy skepticism is to improve health by reducing harm from misleading health information. I may join. Uh, the approval process for the first statin drug, so the story picks up with this FDA historian. It illustrates how the FDA, academia, and industry were able to work together to nurture the full potential of a drug that might have otherwise not have been developed. Back to the healthy skeptics. Surrogate endpoints also play an important role in pharmaceutical promotion. They're used in advertisements, and the expectation is that we as doctors will make the inferential leap from lowering LDL cholesterol to lowering risk of CBD. Okay, at the time of approval, the FDA had residual safety concerns about lens, cataracts, because triparanol caused cataracts, liver and muscles, because they saw elevation of muscle enzymes and liver enzymes in some of these um, patients. No mention of cancer. Uh, that's interesting. So they err on the side of safety. And they market lovastatin, but you had to have a slip bank exam. Am I the old? I don't think I'm the oldest person in the room. Do you all, do you all remember the older people here that you had to get slip lamp, slit lamps exams for all your patients that you were first putting on lovastatin? Well, that ended because the phase four investigations, these post-marketing trials, showed no evidence for it, so we could stop the slit lamp examinations. But lo and behold, you know, 25 years later, ah, they do cause cataracts, and especially in people with type two diabetes. And it's plausible because the lens requires a high cholesterol for proper cell development. Well, you know, I actually, uh, I actually gave this talk to my wife last night just to time it, you know, and she says, well, who cares about cataracts? You know, you can always take the cataract out. If it's saving your life, that's great, you know, so have the cataract out. Well, she's right. I'm really more concerned with cancer. I'm really more concerned with the carcinogenicity of these drugs than in their cataract formation. And there were data in rodents that the FDA was aware of, and this was an amazing publication that I read when it was published in GM in 1996. Here are their sources, their data sources. Here are the data. These drugs have been shown to cause cancer in rodents. 
And these relative exposures, they're not so high compared to human exposure. They're higher, but they're not that much higher. And we're talking about acute you know, or subacute effects. We're not talking about putting these rats on these drugs for the next 25 years. So how did it happen that cholesterol-lowering agents were approved by the FDA long-term use in spite of their animal carcinogenicity? So they actually went in and got the minutes from a, a, a Freedom of Information Act request, and this is what they found. The only reported discussion of animal carcinogenicity studies at the FDA advisory meeting on lovastatin was by the rep from Merck, who downplayed the importance of the studies. Okay, so 10 years later, we start seeing some signal in humans. Maybe it's noise, maybe it's signal. You be the judge. Here's the um, PROSPER study that we talked about earlier, the negative study in diabetes. It wasn't just a diabetic study. It was a large, very large trial. It was a, diabetes was a subset. That was the negative study. That was over to the right of the forest plot. And lo and behold, the patients 70 to 82 uh, were randomized to pravastatin or placebo, and they had a statistically significant increased risk of all forms of cancer over placebo. 1.25 didn't cross the confidence line. Well, they saw these data, and they went back, and this is unusual for a big trial like this. They actually presented some meta-analyses data on this issue within the body of this work. So the same paper. So they did a meta-analysis of all the pravastatin studies. Do they cause cancer? Cancer incidence in all the major statin trials and other statins, pravastatin and other statins. And they concluded that, well, this crosses, this, does, this is right on the line, so it doesn't. And we showed it in our study, but these studies didn't. And if we do a meta-analysis, it's not really true. Well, again, the devil's in the details. Let's take a look at these studies. So they said the lipid trial, that was over here. Okay, no increased risk of cancer like this. That was over here. But if you look at it, if you look at the body of the work, you see that among the older patients, because there were young patients and old patients in that trial, unlike the PROSPER trials, all old people. If you just looked at the older patients, lo and behold, they did have a statistically significant difference in cancer. The CARE trial, also negative for increased risk of cancer, but if you just looked at breast cancer, only one out of the 290 patients in the placebo group had breast cancer. 12 out of the 286 patients in the pravastatin group got breast cancer. Signal? I don't know. More data from, now this is a case control trial. Um, they looked at patients with lymphoid malignancies, and they looked at patients who had just orthopedic or ENT patients, you know. And uh, these are the numbers, and they said 13.3% of the patients with lymphoid malignancies had been taking statins, and only 7.3% of this control group had been taking statins. Not great data. But, you know, signal or noise, I don't know. Of interest is that 25 out of these 29 were taking pravastatin. So does pravastatin promote cancer in elderly patients? A real meta-analysis published by the Canadian, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2007. Here's their forest plot. And unclear. It does seem to cry. It's over on this side of the line. The risk ratio is over on this side of the line, but it does just touch the... 1.0 mark. So their conclusion was that it does suggest an association between pravastatin therapy and cancer in elderly patients. However, given the importance of this potential association, we need further verification. Okay. Uh, now, that's pravastatin. What about the other statins? Here's a little bit of data on simvastatin. Now, you know, you can criticize this study because it's a cohort study, 47,000 people, but those patients who were treated and had the lowest cholesterol levels, had the highest relative risk of getting um, cancer. Well, people with low cholesterol levels tend to have a higher risk of cancer. Maybe it's the cancer that's giving them low cholesterol levels. Not proof, for sure. Okay, 4S, if you take out all the, uh, if you take out from the simvastatin, the two big simvastatin trials, the 4S trial, which happened in Scandinavia in the heart protection study, which we talked about, had some diabetics in it. And you look at their non-melanoma skin cancers, 
there was a statistically significant increased risk if you combine the studies for non-melanoma skin cancers. So back to Newman and Hulley, if drugs from this class caused a rapid increase in a particular cancer, especially an otherwise uncommon cancer, this adverse effect could be discovered from post-marketing surveillance and possibly tumor registries. On the other hand, if, as in the case of smoking, the cancer risk is delayed for decades, we're not going to see it. And it could have very important public health consequences. And this non-melanoma skin cancer, well, the oncologists tell me that that might be a little bit of a canary in a cave because that might be the earliest cancer you might see from a carcinogen. So their conclusion is you probably should reserve statins for people, this is in 1996, probably should reserve statins for people at high short-term risk of heart disease and be wary about long-term use. And by the way, here's the meta-analysis I showed you on primary prevention of coronary disease and diabetes. These are, the, these are the follow-up years. So most of the studies, you know, the average follow-up was four years or so. And that's typical of these trials. And Here's a trial from the C's study, simvastatin. Now, this has azetamibe added into it, so it's not a pure simvastatin trial in patients with aortic stenosis. And here you can see the curves really are starting to separate here. This, here the numbers are too low at five years to really make any, uh, you know, any claims, but the numbers seem to be separating at four, and then the trial is stopped. Yeah. Okay. So what's the counterpoint? What's the point to that? That's the counterpoint. What's the point? Well, here's the point. This is what the proponents of statin use in, for primary prevention of diabetes say. Well, okay, there's some signal out there, but it may not be reality because if we use, look at this huge meta-analysis, I've never actually seen a meta-analysis bigger than this, 175,000 people in 27 trials again from the CTT collaborators, published in PLOS One 2012. Here's the, here's the plot. This is it per millimole reduction in LDL. Here's the number of patients. And uh, statin versus control, more versus less statins, really negative, negative, negative. Negative, 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 yeah, yeah. But, 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 here's Nate Silver. He's the guy who predicted 49 out of 50 states Obama was going to win. In the 50th state, he probably was right also. He writes that the volume of information may be increasing, but the signal-to-noise ratio may be waning. We may be getting overwhelmed. So when they conclude that a median of five years of statin therapy had no effect on the incidence of mortality from any type of cancer, you have to put that information into context. Because without it, we have really no way to differentiate signal from noise, and our search for the truth might be swamped by the false negatives. And that turns out to be true of statins in myopathy. Here you have Robert Rosenson saying, yeah, in the clinical trials of statin therapy, the myopathy, the, the benign myalgias were no greater than placebo. But we've all seen patients with nuanced myalgias they stop the drug, they get better, they resume the drug, they get worse. We've all seen it. I've seen pa patients going all six, over and over and over. And of course, there's a lot of biological plausibility to muscle damage in patients on statins. Here's a statin therapy induces ultrastructural, these patients were asymptomatic. And they just biopsied them, they were on statins, and they biopsied their muscles, and they biopsied eight controls in 14 patients, and yeah, one control one fiber from one control had ultrastructural chain damage, but most of the patients, 80% of the patients, had at least one or more fibers that had damage. And here's the, some, some micrographs. Here, uh, you remember the sarcomere? That's the segment between the neighboring Z lines. That's the muscle unit with the actin and the myosin sliding back and forth and the actin anchored at the Z line. So if you look at the Z lines in these patients, they're slightly deviated. They're not straight. And that's early damage, early sign of muscle damage. Also, they showed in the myofibril these kind of contraction bands. That's an indication of uncontrolled calcium influx. They didn't just look at the myofibril. They looked at the sarcolemma as well, which is the cell that lines the cell membrane, that lines the muscle. 
The sarcolemma has this T-tubular system that emanates from it that's very enriched in cholesterol. And if you remember your physiology, it's a very sophisticated three-dimensional organization, and the T-tubules kind of infold in so they can transmit the action potentials into the cell's interior. And you can see the control versus the statin. You can see these, these electron micrographs show these fissures, fissuring in the subsarcolemmal space there. And then you can see the little remnants here. These, little rem these don't belong there. These are the little remnants of the T-tubular system. Yeah? Maybe it's why you can demonstrate this. This was in the JACC a few months ago. Simvastatin impairs exercise training adaptations. You look at VO2 peak, right? The peak oxygen uptake under maximal aerobic capacity. Exercise goes up. This patient on the statin with exercise doesn't go up. Maybe it's because they can't increase citrate synthesis activity, which is a marker of skeletal muscle mitochondrial content. Maybe it's why these patients are more fatigued and they have muscle fatigue, they have tiredness, exertional fatigue. This is a energy fatigue X score. Never actually heard of that before I read this study. And you can see placebo versus the statins, all patients and women, simvastatin and pravastatin. Okay, so why is this happening? Here's a nice review I commend to you from Diabetes Care a few months ago. Exact cause of statin-induced myopathy remains elusive, but maybe it's reduction in isoprenoids, including ubiquinone or CoQ10. He was more certain about why the randomized controlled trials actually didn't show it. They may be misleading for several reasons. First of all, if you have a history of statin intolerance, you can't get into the study. They often have these run-in phases. So if you get symptoms in the run-in phase, you're booted. So that biases the study towards not showing risk. And the patients who tend to be at risk, uh, they comprise a large proportion of the patients we treat in the real world, but they are underrepresented in randomized trials. And in some of these studies, they defined it as elevated CK and ignored the myalgia issue completely. Okay. Other well-documented adverse events. You can get a very severe inflammatory myopathy, a necrotizing myopathy, a peripheral neuropathy. This I've seen myself. Uh, patients stop the drug, goes away, put the drug back, comes back. So I'm pretty convinced of this. Uh, and I've seen permanent peripheral neuropathy. You can get, you get transient and persistent elevation in transaminases from the liver. Rare episodes of more severe liver injury. Proteinuria, believed to be a benign finding. In rare episodes of renal failure, although this may not be so rare based on the study, use of high potency statins is actually associated with an increased rate of diagnosis for acute kidney injury and hospital admissions compared to low potency statins early in the drug treatment. And then we have the cognitive side effects. So the FDA in 2012 in February released this adverse event information, a review of adverse events from 97 to 2002, 60 reports. 14 had improvement when they stopped the statin, and four recurred. So it's anecdotal evidence, but four recurred. This got a lot of people around here to stop statins. And you know, I have personal friends. I have three personal friends who stopped statins at that point and had their memory come back. I know three people. That's me personally. It's not my patients. I had to ask myself the question, why did it take them 10 years? These anecdotal reports were back in 2002. What, what took 10 years? Well, there's no... There's no public record of why there's a delay, but there is a public record on what happened in 2008 in Europe. This is the UK equivalent of our FDA. And they issued this pronouncement, patients should be made aware that treatment with statins may be associated with depression, etc. Many months on, product information for statins has yet to be updated by the MHRA. Why? This was published in this Drug and Therapeutic Bulletin. Well, we discovered that the implementation of the changes was delayed throughout the whole European Union because one of the innovator MA holders, marketing authorization holders, was not in agreement with the wording. In other words, a drug company has been able to stall the inclusion of key safety warnings. And there's biological plausibility to this because we can see that in high doses, dogs get CNS toxic, endothelial degeneration and hemorrhage, and at lower doses, you got to wait about 18 months, but after 18 months, you see the same thing on postmortem examination. Now, they didn't know why this was happening, but there are later data, 
that may be relevant to this. Here's a study on glial cells. This is an in vitro study on glial cells. Remember, glial cells are not neuronal. They're the non-neuronal cells that create, form the myelin, provide support for the neurons. You drop lovastatin on a, on a glial cell, and it induces this chromatin condensation, nuclear fragmentation. Now, granted, this is probably levels above what you would achieve in serum. Here's another study on, now we're talking about rat cortical neurons. Control, drop 300 micromolar of pravastatin, and you put in mevalinate, and you protect the cell from this cell death, from the neuronal cell death. Now again, what is 300 micromolar of pravastatin? The Cmax of pravastatin in serum of humans and healthy people is only 0.1. So, and you don't detect pravastatin in CSF because it's not lipid soluble. So they concluded that this may not have any relevance to humans, but they also studied simvastatin and lovastatin at various concentrations, and they looked at cell death. And you can see that between 0 and 0.1, you already started to see micromolar, you already started to see drop in numbers of cells, neuron cells. And the concentration of lovastatin in CSF is about 20% that in serum. The typical serum concentration is between 0.05 and 0.5 micromolar. So therefore, if you do the math, the CSF concentration could be 0.01 to 0.1. Here's 0.1. You're already seeing 20% cell death. They trace this to geronyl, geronyl pyrophosphate, because if you add in mevalinate, it stops it. If you add in GGPP, it stops it. What is geronyl, geronyl pyrophosphate? Well, it's an isoprenoid. It's, a, it's in this pathway, and again, here's the, here's the uh, source of all isoprenoids made from mevalinate, and it's made into these two molecules, which are called, which are molecules that participate in protein isoprenylation. What is that? Well, some of these molecules, these molecules participate in prenylating proteins that get inserted into your cell membranes, nucleus, all these different plasma, you know, these lipid uh, bilayers. What about the hyperglycemic effect of statins? February 2012, same, same warning, same time as, the same time as the uh, mental status warning, the FDA issued a warning that it's been associated with hyperglycemia. The latest analysis was from 2011 in the JACC, and here's the uh, sort of a meta-analysis of three trials, and they were all had a higher relative risk than placebo. Uh, and one of them did reach statistical significance. But the guy who published this, David Waters, said, the eh, biggest point I want to emphasize about this study is it's not a big deal. You should not stop taking statins because you're afraid of developing diabetes. I don't think it's a big deal. Compared to the risk of cardiovascular disease, the risk of developing diabetes is paltry. Now, if you already have diabetes and you get put on a statin, if you go long enough, uh, this is the baseline. This is uh, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. After six weeks of therapy, after 18 weeks of therapy, the di patients with diabetes had a rise in their hemoglobin A1C. So the editor-in-chief in diabetic medicine where this paper was published, statins and glycemic control are cause for concern. Should we be concerned? Well, the answer based on current evidence is no. Any increase in glucose is completely offset by the dramatic reductions in early cardiovascular events and diabetes, presumably, including MI and strokes. In the ideal world, it would be nice to have both glycemic and ultimately cardiovascular endpoints, but we do what we do. Well, I'm not sure about this because it is true that the, that the increased risk of diabetes is rather small and the increase in blood sugar is rather small, but what's the mechanism? What if the mechanism is raising insulin resistance, which it turns out to be? So the mechanism of statin-induced hyperglycemia may be by raising insulin resistance by inhibiting this pathway. You know, insulin acts on a uh, transmembrane receptor to act through this complicated pathway to transport GLUT4 back to the receptor, which is what gloms onto the glucose and sucks up the glucose into cellular. That's how insulin acts. Well, what, what these folks uh, showed in the Davidologia is that it, Nakata showed that a atorvastatin attenuates GLUT4 expression, inhibits adipocyte maturation, and accelerates glucose intolerance. Now, this may not be trivial, 
because uh, statin therapy does worsen insulin sensitivity in women with PCOS. They don't have diabetes yet, but these patients tend to be insulin resistant. And this was just published in the JCEM, and they looked at these patients. They did something called an insulin. You don't see this very often. This, uh, this impressed me. They did an insulinogenic index. What is that? Well, that's a 30-minute insulin increment. So they give an oral glucose tolerance says, see how quickly the insulin level goes up. And this is the atorvastatin group before atorvastatin, after atorvastatin. And this is the placebo group before the placebo, after the placebo. Unfortunately, the groups weren't well matched. So that's a defect in the study. Uh, but you can see that they had very little increment in insulin from placebo. And they had a statistically significant increase in insulin secretion. Now, this may be more important than the increased prevalence of diabetes or the rise in blood sugar that you can just deal with with a little bit more extra insulin or drug, uh, because insulin may have a role independently in causing atherosclerosis. So here's some data from Finland looking at risk factors for coronary artery disease and finding that the higher your quintile of fasting insulin level, the greater your risk of gaining age-adjusted prevalence of coronary artery disease, both men with diabetes as well as in non-diabetes, as well as diabetic women and non-diabetic women. There's some biological plausibility for this because insulin has now been shown to promote macrophage foam cell formation. Here's a foam cell. Here's a, foam, here's a monocyte turning into a foam cell by ingesting the uh, lipid. So how does it work? Foam cells are generated by the uptake of not LDL, but modified LDL. LDL doesn't cause foam cell generation. It's got to be modified, mostly oxidized. So somehow the LDL gets into the, beyond the endothelial surface. The monocytes also get in beyond the endothelium. This is where they reside. Then if you have cell-mediated oxidation, you develop oxidized LDL, and that's what creates the foam cell. Then the foam cells multiply. And so you get these foam cells, and that's what forms the fatty streak, which is the precursor to getting atherosclerosis. Now, the prevalence of fatty streak is 100 percent. Not everybody who gets fatty streaks goes on to develop atherosclerosis. This process probably has to become overwhelmed, uh, but that's the beginning of it. Now, how does oxidized LDL get into the foam cell? Through a receptor called CD36. It's a class B scavenger receptor that's also found on the cell membrane. And what um, Park showed was that insulin at 2 nanomolar upregulates CD36. And by upregulating CD36, okay, if you give the cell oxidized LDL cholesterol, no insulin, it, the cholesterol content goes from here to here. If you give the cell uh, LDL, oxidized LDL cholesterol and you add an insulin, it goes from here to here. So this difference is due to 2 nanomolar of insulin. So you're increasing. Now, is this physiologic? Is 2 nanomolar physiologic? Mm -hmm. So when we measure insulin in humans, the maximum measurement in people with insulin resistance goes up to as high as 1.6. Well, he didn't study 1.6. He studied untreated in 2. We don't know what happens between 0 and 2. So is the common soil hypothesis incorrect? Counterpoint to this common soil hypothesis is that is the possibility that the metabolic environment created by the diabetes itself is a major mediator of the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And that was supported by this recent study by these folks from Harvard who did a genome-wide association study from 1,500 cases, 2,600 controls. These studies, they look at huge numbers of common genetic variants in all these individuals to see if any of these variants is associated with a trait. And what they showed was that they identified a previously unknown genetic locus associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease among type 2 diabetics, but not in people without diabetes, just in diabetics. And what is that locus? It's in the GLUL gene. And what's the GLUL gene? It affects glutamate and glutamine metabolism. Now, we certainly don't have time to talk about glutamine and glutamate metabolism, but glutamate is made into glutathione. And glutathione goes through this cycle of reduction in oxidation. Redox, reactive oxygen species generated during oxidative stress can induce severe damage to biomolecules like LDL cholesterol. To prevent this damage, we're endowed with these defenses, these antioxidant molecules. One of them is glutathione. 
So maybe it has more to do with oxidation of LDL than with uh, LDL cholesterol levels in serum itself. So I wanted to leave time at the end for uh, tomato throwing or eggs or something, but I'm going to, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to really get into oxidative stress and diabetic complications, but I just want to point out this article, which is a nice summary. And let's not ignore the vascular endothelium as a potential uh, cause of uh, diabetic atherosclerosis in people with diabetes. Here's some nice pictures of the transformation of endothelial cell morphology from shear stress. So if you have high shear stress versus low shear stress, you see the cells line up, these bovine aortic endothelial cells after 24 hours of high versus low, line up better. Now, the cardiologists in the room will say you get atherosclerosis everywhere, but it does seem to have a predilection for these branch points where there's low shear stress because of flow separation, low shear stress because of flow separation, and this is where you get a predilection for atherosclerosis. And so later paper, this is a wonderful paper by Xu Chen. He was asked to lecture at the Cannon Award Lecture. And he lectured on the mechanotransduction and endothelial cell homeostasis, the wisdom of the cell. And the reason he called it the wisdom of the cell is because Cannon is Walter Cannon. Walter Cannon, here's a picture of him in China. He expanded on Claude Bernard's concept of homeostasis. He published a book in 1932 called The Wisdom of the Body. One of his protégés was uh, this fellow here, who turned out to be a protégé of Dr. Qian, who came and gave this wonderful lecture, and that this lecture got published in this physiologic journal, and he points out that at branch points where you have static condition versus straight parts where you have laminar flow, in the laminar flow areas you get fiber alignment along the long axis, you get low monocyte adhesion, you get low LDL permeability, you get down regulation of genes that raise the intracellular lipids, you get down regulation of inflammatory genes, and this is all anti-atherogenic. At branch points where the flow is disturbed, you get atherogenic uh, effects. So this is really the, the uh, possibly one of the pathophysiologic ways that um, atherosclerosis begins. And he has this nice, beautiful summary. I'll just take a little time to read it. To prevent atherogenesis, we need to avoid risk factors, smoking, obesity, hyperglycemia, lack of exercise, which superimpose on local hemodynamic factors to cause atherogenesis in these lesion-prone areas. Now, one of the potential benefits of exercise is to change the hemodynamic patterns. You increase cardiac output in regional blood flow, and you have to do, but it's got to be moderate exercise, not light exercise, and that can eliminate complex flow patterns, thus supporting the notion that adverse hemodynamic conditions at branch points may be the mechanism for atherosclerosis, and if you eliminate it with exercise, that can promote your health. So whereas the wisdom of the cell by itself can serve to maintain the homeostasis of cells under some conditions, it needs to be aided by other mechanisms that involve the wisdom of the body beyond the cell, such as the increase in blood flow and exercise. We also need the wisdom of the mind to make our body do things that are good, regular exercise, appropriate intensity, duration, avoidance of other risk factors, smoking, poor eating habits. I tend to agree with that, but there's a counterpoint to that. There is a counterpoint to that. You've got to read this. This is, a wonderful, uh, this is a wonderful essay by Iona Heath, published a month ago or two. Uh, she quotes McCormick from 1994. Health promotion falls far short of meeting ethical imperatives for screening, diminishes health. You're better off encouraging your patients to lead lives of modified hedonism so that they can enjoy the, may enjoy in the full the only life they're likely to have. So my own personal physician brought me this paper a, a few weeks ago. I think it's a nice getting back to topic on the use of statins for the primary prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And this is by Montori from the Mayo Clinic on the optimal practice of evidence-based medicine. Informed patients may choose not to follow a guideline that does not incorporate their preferences, for example, statins and diabetes. When patients were at low cardiovascular risk, 
we're given the information of the small absolute reduction in risk, not the relative, but when they were given this information about absolute reduction in risk and how small it is, they were 70 percent less likely to offer a statin. Where the use of statins in patients with diabetes is linked to quality measures or performance incentives, clinicians face the conflict of following either the guideline or the informed patient, and that's our problem. And that's really the genesis for the talk, because this has to do with guidelines. This really has to do with the uh, 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 alternative quality contract that most of us signed with Blue Cross Blue Shield back in 2012, which caused for us to be treating all our diabetic patients with statins to get their LDL cholesterol below 100. I want to give the last word to Dr. Endo, who was interviewed by a Wall Street Journal reporter, and he says, yeah, my LDL was 155, but I, I wouldn't take the statin. I exercise more. Now, why wouldn't he take the statin? He can only cite a Japanese proverb. Anybody speak Japanese here? The indigo dye wears white trousers. I can only assume the indigo dye is a toxic, a toxin. The indigo dye is, I think, is a cynical statement. Okay, I left a half hour for questions. That's great, huh? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So are there any populations in which um, perhaps statins were not prescribed as much as in one population as another? Oh, yeah, I told you I would, yeah. Are there okay, so, yeah, I prepared that slide. I was, yeah, thank you for, okay. So that had to do with a, a small study that a private practitioner did in response to this article. He read this article in the BMJ in 2011 on the true cost of pharmacological disease prevention. And what Dravenin wrote was that on the effectiveness of preventive drugs, the gap between the ideal and clinical circumstances raises the question of how well our most widely used preventive drugs work in real life. Because all these studies that we talked about are not they're all pharmaceutical sponsored studies with run-in periods and biases. What about real life? There's no real world life data on using statins in diabetes. What really happens? So if we consider efficacy studies as the bottom rung of Cochrane's hierarchy ladder, which means efficacy and not effectiveness, efficacy is the bottom rung, effectiveness is the second rung, and cost effectiveness is the third rung, he points out that there are claims that these drugs like statins are effective or cost effective, but there really are no valid data on the effectiveness. So some smart guy, I think he's smart, he read this, Sam Lewis, and he said, boy, he said, large randomized clinical trials are considered to represent the strongest form of evidence in assessing whether a particular healthcare intervention works. We agree. And so we've been prescribing statins to many of our patients. In fact, he says somewhere else in the paper that he, got, he has about an 18% or 20% penetration rate. On the other hand, he says, little attention has been paid to the fact that people treated in a large, multi-center randomized trial may not accurately reflect my population. So seeing that nobody studied people in North Pembrokeshire, where I live, let's take a look. So in an effort to justify our prescription practice, he examined his own practice. He did a real-world study. So he found 5,600 patients on their list five, from five years ago, and some of them declined the statin, even though they had a greater than 20% risk of getting a heart attack. Based on the Framingham risk factors analysis, some of them wouldn't take it or they were intolerant of it. They just wouldn't do it for whatever reason. So he had some patients on no statin, some patients who started statins during the five years, and some patients who were on statin all five years. And it turned out that the expected rate of heart attack in the no statin group was 226, and 13 had it. And when you looked at the people on some statin or, no, or, or, or statin all of those five years, you would have expected 168 people to have a heart attack. And how many did? Yeah, it, it was lower than 168, but it wasn't as low as the no statin group. It was dramatic. So it didn't work in the real world. Interesting. I find that interesting. Well, maybe they were exercising more than no staff. Exactly. Good point. Exactly. It's not a randomized prospective control trial. Yeah. Well, maybe we should be telling our patients to exercise then. Huh? 
Well, the absence, yeah, but that doesn't mean that if they don't, then this becomes a substitute. I don't know, I don't, you know, so, that, you know, I think we've kind of lost the art of doing nothing in that situation. Maybe we'd be better off doing nothing. Harvey. Who would you consider a high-risk diabetic who does not have known coronary artery disease in whom a statin would be justified as pre in prescribing? Well, I'll tell you the truth. I don't, I think the number needed to treat a 40 is not reality. And I don't think that these drugs should be used for anybody, basically. I, that's my opinion. Because I think the data are too, I think the effectiveness is just not great enough. And the potential for harm is much greater than the effectiveness that's even, than the efficacy that's been demonstrated. Based on my review of this work, yeah. I, I'm very selective. I don't prescribe them much. Yeah, Andy. You said you wouldn't use, use these drugs. Is that means in primary prevention or secondary prevention? Well, I asked um, a lecturer uh, last month on what he felt the number needed to treat for secondary prevention was. And he said it was 25. So that means you have to treat 24 people unnecessarily, people who have already had a heart attack, to benefit one person. And all of that information also is generated by the pharmaceutical companies sponsoring the drugs, all of it. And so, and there's no, again, here's the real world data. These people had a greater than 20% risk, but the non-standing group, I mean, I, I really don't know. I'm not sure. So if you, what I do is I inform the patient. The number needed to treat is 25. The studies go out five years at most. Uh, the adverse effects are uh, not fully explored in these studies, and you leave it up to the patient. Everybody's got to make their own decision, just like the paper you showed me. That's it? <laughs> Matthew. I'm very, you know, I would think, wouldn't think twice about giving someone a blood pressure medication. So if I was giving someone lisinopril. Well, the number needed to treat, that's a good point. So and this has become very controversial in the, in the blood pressure world, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was training back in the early, set, when I was in medical school in 1971, that was just around the time that a VA study had been published showing the benefit of antihypertensive agents. This was the beginning, the late 60s, right? So what was the benefit? The, the number needed to treat was two, but these people had really high blood pressure. Okay, number needed to treat two, that's a pretty good number. Maybe it was one if, you went, if the study went long enough, right? But those people had high blood pressure. And then the threshold got lowered, and lowered, and lowered. And now we're seeing that the threshold has been lowered too low, and now the pendulum is swinging back. Have you noticed this in the last few months? Towards a higher blood pressure. Because the number needed to treat with a blood pressure of 160 over 100 is probably infinity. It may be infinity. There may not be a benefit, but everybody's different. So I think the number needed to treat for mild to moderate high blood pressure, mild high blood pressure may also be way too high to justify use of drug intervention. If you can get your blood pressure down with diet and exercise, Non-pharmacologic means that's one thing. You're better off having a lower blood pressure. But if it takes drugs to lower it, you're not better off having a low blood pressure. That's just, that was, those are the data. So the number needed to treat, I don't know the right number to warrant chronic pharmacologic intervention. Uh, I don't know the right number. I leave it up to each individual patient. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't have, uh, we, we, shouldn't, we, sh we shouldn't have financial incentives built into contracts with insurance companies telling us you gotta do this to every patient. That's my strong opinion. What about more actually screening people with, for if they may have, you know, atherosclerosis or 
Well, you know, here's the thing. You know, with, with, you know, either <coughs> um, calcium, you know, screening in coronary arteries or carotid intimal thickness, things like that. Well, it's a difficult topic. Uh, you know, I don't know if you saw the Times yesterday, but uh, there was a nice pa there was a nice article on reduction in risk of atherosclerosis. We're di we are we are having a and I showed a slide. We're having a significant impact over the course of the last few decades in reducing risk of atherosclerosis. But you got to die of something, so the risk of dying of cancer is going up. Now, atherosclerosis is a disease of aging. We find it in they're finding it in mummies from all different parts of the world from four or five thousand years ago, and. You can't, and the, the prevalence of lipid, uh, of fatty streaks is 100%. So we're all prone, and as we age, the, the real etiology of atherosclerosis really isn't understood, but it might actually have to do with the aging of the lipid bilayer, because the phospholipids change. Okay? The, the proportion of different phospholipids in the lipid bilayer change, and some of these attract calcium into them, and that may be an initiating event. It's so complex uh, that um, looking for one specific risk factor to modify is really not likely to lead to substantial reduction in risk. Um, I don't know what else to say. I know it's a tough topic because we're all kind of wedded to use of these drugs and we believe, you know, most people believe in their tremendous effectiveness, but when you really scratch the surface, it may not be true. And I've just scratched the surface. You know, I could have gone on for another four or five hours. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm not happy about it either. <laughs> yeah. I think you've got to be very wary, particularly in primary prevention, of using drugs long term that have only been studied short term, particularly when there's all this signal of uh, badness. And hypothetically, you know, these drugs, these statin agents, these HMG inhibiting HMG chorioretic reductase uh, to inhibit, uh, to lower LDL cholesterol, I doubt in the end that that's going to actually be a good thing to be doing to our population. We're doing a huge experiment. There are 35 million people on these drugs now in this country. So we're doing the experiment. We'll see what happens in 10 or 20 years. Peter. So you put those patients who elect with your rather pessimistic outline of uh, what the benefits of statins might be. You put those patients on ubiquinone? Do I? Yeah. No, I try not to deal with this at all. <laughs> how, how does the ubiquinone know where to go? That's my question. What are the data that coenzyme Q10 supplementation actually does anything? I ch anybody, anybody know any data? The real data? I don't. Uh, maybe there are, but... Well, you reversed some of the effects of the HMGO-CoA reductase inhibitor by adding a downstream metabolite. That but, but you're taking it orally. Is it getting into the cell? I don't know. I have no idea. Does anybody? I don't know. You know, there were seven or 8,000 articles published in 2012. If you just pub, pub med, if you just go into PubMed and put in atherosclerosis, You'll get eight or nine thousand hits just for 2012, and uh, it's going up like that, you know. So it's a huge body of work that there's no way to explore all this information. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.